Okay, well, uh, welcome back. I, in my last lecture, I talked about the platform that we'd built, eScience Central, and I gave some slides on some of the work we've done on scheduling to try and scale out applications across a lot of nodes. There are other things you have to consider when you're using clouds, and one of the ones which has been quite uh, seen as being important is security. And um, sometimes people will say, well, we can't use clouds because they don't meet our security requirements. And you sometimes find people in uh, IT departments in organizations who, who say that. And my feeling is quite often it's because they don't want people in the organization to use clouds because that might be a, a threat to that organization, uh, the, the IT department. But there are some genuine concerns, and when we were using eScience Central, we started to expand the range of applications that we were using it for, and we came across some where security was a real issue. So Tony Hare, in his talk uh, last week, said that Jim Gray, the great Jim Gray, had um, chosen astronomy as an application because it had no financial value whatsoever, and so nobody cared what you did with the, the data. And of course, there's nothing in astronomy which identifies people either. As soon as you start to store information about people, you often run into issues to do with security. We started to get other parts of, the, of Newcastle University and other organizations interested in using eScience Central, but they wanted to store information about people, for example, medical information. And so we had to start to worry about security. Thank you. And so what I'm going to do is security in clouds is an enormous area. So I'm going to focus on what some of the issues are and then one of the ways in which we've tried to address security in the applications we work with. So I'll talk about security concerns. And then I'll talk about private clouds as well as public clouds. And then we'll look at federated clouds, which are becoming very popular. So if you were around working in IT in about 2000 or before that, then life was quite a bit simpler because you had your organization and within it you had some computers and you offered internal services to people who work for your organization and external services to your clients, your, your customers. And of course, you worried as soon as you made a service available over the internet, perhaps through the web, to external users, then you worried about people attacking your services. So all of these attacks that people do where they find holes in, um, holes in computer applications, for example, attacks where you put pieces of SQL in the forms that you, you submit back to, a, to an application in the hope of compromising the, the access to the database, then all of these were something that people worried about and still do worry about. Um, once you've got a cloud, then you also have to worry about people attacking those services, but also there's a possibility that if your organization is using that cloud, people might intercept data as it comes from within your organization to the external cloud. And of course, it is possible for people to attack from within a cloud as, uh, as well. So the, these are the sorts of issues which make people uh, nervous about using clouds for every application, particularly those that are sensitive. And so what, what do we what do we do about this? Well, there's various things that people do. I think important ones are, first of all, you should know something about the cloud infrastructure that you are using. There's quite a lot of clouds available now. And so you should look to see what certification, security certification level they have. You should look at the experience of other customers with those clouds and make sure that you can trust the underlying infrastructure. But even then, you can't beat having skillful, clever people like yourselves to design these applications to make sure that there aren't ways to compromise the data or the services which are running 
in the cloud because most attacks on applications aren't attacks through faults in the infrastructure, they're through problems with the way in which the application has been designed or, or written. Secondly, you can think about encrypting data to and from the cloud. So if you're interested in, uh, if you're worried about somebody who might be able to access the data going over the internet to your application in the, in the cloud or back again, then you can worry about that and you can use some form of encryption. But finally, the, uh, a message from my last talk was about the importance of using cloud platforms. And I would say that rather than build everything from the ground up with all of the potential security issues that that might raise, then it's a good thing to try and build on a high-level platform. Uh, so I mentioned eSign Central in the, in the last talk, but there are others. So if you look at uh, public clouds like Azure, for example, then that offers things like well-designed cloud database services. And so using one of those, you're much less likely to hit security problems than if you deploy your own database infrastructure on the cloud. Because the company, if, if a company who have a lot of expertise in databases, a lot of expertise in cloud, are putting this up as a service, then they're going to put a lot of effort into making it secure, more than most other organizations can afford to, can afford to do. And as a result of this, then we're starting to see clouds being used for a much greater range of applications, some of which we might consider to be very sensitive. So uh, a good one is CloudForce. So, so uh, si uh, actually, it's Salesforce, isn't it? Salesforce.com, which is a CRM system, a customer relationship management system. And companies put details of all of their customers in there, all of their salespeople, what the customers have bought. And this is now becoming very common indeed. And this is in a cloud, so people are prepared to trust clouds with this very sensitive information. Others doing payroll, which requires you to put information about your employees, their social security numbers, their addresses, and their salaries. Very sensitive information, but people are using clouds through companies like Workday for that. Email, of course, with Gmail and Outlook. Again, putting sensitive company information, perhaps, uh, into the cloud through your email system. Again, more companies are prepared to do this. There's healthcare systems now, like Microsoft Health Vault, which I mentioned on, on Friday, where you can store um, very sensitive information about your health in the cloud. And more and more financial companies are also using this. And again, the there are risks associated with storing financial information in the cloud, but companies are feeling more, um, more comfortable with, with doing that. And it's because they consider the positive signs, which are the, the scalability and the cost, uh, that they can, the cost reductions that they can get, and they balance that with security, and they believe that the balance is tipped towards using a cloud. But what if this isn't enough? So what if we have company confidential data that we feel we wouldn't like to send out over the internet to a, to a cloud? Well, if we have some medical data. So in my university, then um, a lot of the projects that are funded in our medical school, they are not allowed to send data outside the university. So whether clouds are more or less secure than the internal IT of the university, it's just not allowed. It's in the contract that the researchers get from the people who fund their research. So they just aren't allowed to, to do that. And a, an example is, which I used before is this healthcare analysis workflow where you start off with some very sensitive data about patients that you want to do some analysis on part of the data, not all of it, but the question is how do you deal with, with this using clouds? So one solution that organizations have come up with, I think, in, in reaction to the growing popularity of public clouds, is to say that they will manage their internal IT as a private cloud. So they call it a private cloud because they try to give it some of the characteristics of a public cloud. So they try to give very dynamic, adaptive ways to grab CPU and to grab storage. So typically with a, an IT organization within a, uh, 
within a company, then it can take a very long time to get computers and storage for the services that you want to introduce. And this has been very frustrating to people, and that's one of the reasons why they've bypassed that, gone around it, and gone directly out to the public cloud. But now, internal IT departments within these companies are trying to address this problem by managing their internal IT as if it was a, if it, as if it was a cloud. And so the advantages that they claim for that is if you believe that your internal IT has high security, then this gives you high security for your applications. If you um, can dynamically manage your internal IT as if it was a cloud, and there is various pieces of software which allow you to, to do that. So um, one of them, for example, is Eucalyptus, which gives you something like the Amazon system, but you can deploy it internally. Another one is Microsoft can gi give you the, the software which allows you to manage your internal IT as if it was like a, an Azure public cloud. And one of the reasons why people do this is, is the last one, because they've got all of this IT kit. It's, a, it's a, what economists call a sunk investment. You've already paid the money for it. You may as well try to get as much benefit as possible from it. You're already paying the salaries of people to look after it, so why not try to use it? But, of course, private clouds have problems that when you consider a comparison with a public cloud like Amazon or Azure, so it costs money, it costs capital funding in order to pay for, <coughs> excuse me, pay for one of these clouds. You have to pay people to manage the, the hardware and the software. And you've got that scalability limitation, which you don't have with public clouds. You have a fixed number of machines in your own internal IT, whereas effectively Amazon or Azure will give you infinite resources. For almost any organization in the world, the, the amount of CPU resources and the amount of data resources that you can get from a public cloud is much greater than you can ever use. So effectively, it's infinite resources available whenever you want it. So there's still problems. And to get around these, what's happened in the last three or four years is people are now talking about cloud federation. So this is where you use your internal IT resources, a private cloud, and your external public cloud resources as if they were one combined resource. So you can see there in the, in the diagram, the organization's IT and external services can make use of both. But how do we decide when we have an application whether to deploy it on a public cloud or internally on a, on a private cloud? And one of the ways in which people do it is this very binary decision-making process. So what you do is you talk to the experts on the application and you say, does this application have a security risk associated with it? And if you, you think that there's some sensitive data and you think that your internal IT is more secure than a, a, an external public cloud, then you put the application on your internal IT, on your private cloud. If not, then you can put it on a public cloud and make use of all of the advantages with, which clouds give. So what's the problem with this? Well, it's very binary. So all of your application goes on one or the other. And what people would like to do sometimes is to say, well, for a, an application, can't we get the benefit of both types of cloud? Can't we get the benefit of both public clouds and private clouds within the same application? And so this is where the second approach is to design applications that span both clouds. So here's an example of this. So th this is what we did for the healthcare application. So because our healthcare researchers had signed a contract to say that the medical data about the patients would not ever leave the university servers, then what we do is we split the workflow. So we start on the left-hand side on our internal IT within the university with the medical information as well as the accelerometry data that I told you about on Friday. You anonymize the data so you just get the the accelerometry information, you put an anonymous ID with it, just a number which identifies a patient record, 
but there's no way anybody just looking at that number could know what, who the patient was. The only way you can do that is through information that's stored within the university. And then you send the data out to the public cloud because analysing all that accelerometry data is where you want the advantages of the public cloud. You want the scalability, you want the access to resources on demand when you need them. So we did this, and we did this manually. We sat around with, a, with, with the experts on the application in a whiteboard, and we worked out how to do this, and then a clever programmer programmed this application. And that's fine, but it made us, it made us nervous. And the reason was, what if we made a mistake? Okay, what if we made a mistake and accidentally some of the secure data was sent out to a public cloud when it wasn't supposed to? Um, or what if we got it wrong? This is a very simple workflow. Sometimes we have workflows with 20 different services in them, lots of different sorts of data with lots of different security levels. It becomes much more difficult to decide how to partition it. The third problem was that often you can get multiple different types of options for doing the partitioning. So there's different ways to do it. How do you decide which is the best way? So what we did was to then think about this and see whether we could formalize it. So I, I said on Friday that one of the um, reasons we like working on real applications is because every now and again somebody comes up with a problem and we realize that we don't know the answer to it. And so that then caused us to do some research. So this is some research that we've done over the last three or four years. And this is what we believe is, the, is the, an approach to take. So first of all, you need to run the same infrastructure on your internal cloud, your private cloud, as well as your public cloud, so that, that makes it easy to partition your application across both of them. If you have different sorts of, of, of infrastructure with different services support, it becomes much more difficult to partition applications. Secondly, what we needed was a rigorous way to do this. We wanted a methodology where we could describe the security requirements of the application and press a button and out would come the options and it would also tell us what the best option was. So that was the research challenge that we tried to address. And we've done this in a particular way, and it's, it's in a paper which is also referenced by the, uh, if you look at the project information for the project that I said, you can find that, that link in there. But if you want to know more details about what I'm going to talk about, you can actually go through that, through that paper. So here's the, here's the, the approach. Um, that, the version of the paper you that you find, if you read it, is just about clouds. I go to uh, a, a bar in Newcastle every Friday night with a friend who's the chief technology officer of a big uh, multi-billion dollar IT company, and he keeps asking me questions about what our system could do. And after we published the first paper, he started to ask me questions. Can it do this? Can it do that? I've just met a customer who wants to do this. Could it do it? And so what we realized that we needed to change what we did so it generalized the system so it worked not just with clouds but also with devices that people might use to access clouds. And also, you've heard of the Internet of Things? So this idea that there'll be lots of sensors for temperature and healthcare sensors and so on, millions of these sensors, billions of sensors, and they will send data into the cloud to be stored and analyzed. So we realized that we also needed to be able to cope with not just clouds, but also client devices and sensors. So what I'll do is I'll talk about a general solution to this problem, which is the one that we, we've, we're now working on in a second paper, which I hope to uh, publish in two weeks' time. But this covers all of these other devices uh, as well. And the sort of issues that my friend asks me about in the bar in Newcastle on Friday are things like BYOD, so bring your own device. I don't know whether that's a phrase that's... Um, is, is there a Russian version of that phrase, BYOD, bring your own device? Sergey might know. What? 
Is there a Russian BYOD? Okay. So what it is, is that in the old days, even 10 years ago, all of the employees of a company would just use the technology which the company provided them with. So the company could decide what technology it trusted, the hardware and the software, and make sure all of its employees just use that. So you would, when you arrived at a company, when I was younger, you had a, a screen on your desk, and that was the only way to access the company's applications, because that screen was connected to a mainframe computer. Then we had laptops arrived 20, 25 years ago, and the only way you could afford a laptop was if your company bought you a laptop. So the company could decide which applications could run on the laptop, which ones couldn't, which sort of laptop to provide you, and it would quite often lock down the software. So you couldn't install your own software on your laptop. It was only software that the company trusted. But that's all changed. People now come to work and they bring their iPads, they bring their surfaces, they bring their mobile phones, and they expect to access the company's applications through those devices. And companies worry about that because it might compromise their applications. Another issue is roaming. So if you have a device, it's got a mobile connection, and you're using it within your company's, um, uh, in your company's offices, it's using the company's Wi-Fi, they trust the company's Wi-Fi. But you then go to Starbucks or to a coffee shop, and you connect through the coffee shop Wi-Fi. Do you trust that? Yeah, no, you don't. Okay, okay. And so, and so companies worry about this because people just use the same application anywhere. So, so, so my friend keeps getting asked these questions for his company software, which is, uh, he actually works for a company called Red Hat, so they, they produce open source software. So they keep being asked these questions. I'm sure it's true of, of lots of companies. Is it safe to deploy the client on an application using an unknown bring-your-own device? So if you, the company produces an app for phones to access the, the company's applications, is it okay for me just to turn up with, with my Android phone or my iPhone or my Windows phone and start using it? Do the company trust that? It could be compromised. I could have got an Android phone, altered the operating system, deployed it on there, so every communication was also sent away somewhere else where it shouldn't. Um, then there's the coffee shop problem that I've mentioned. And then there's back to clouds, which applications, which services can we deploy on a public cloud? Which data can we allow to go to a public cloud? And finally, uh, which data items can be safely transferred over the internet to a public cloud? So this is what we our method had to tackle. So this is what it, it does. So the idea is you've got somebody who's an expert on security who can specify the security requirements for the services and the data in your application. They also specify the range of platforms, so clouds or devices, which the application or parts of it may be deployed on and the security levels. They can also specify information about the networks that they're prepared to have these applications run on. And the idea is you then press a button in an application, in a tool, and it tells you whether or not this application can be run on these particular platforms. Okay, or you can, you can explore, you can say, what happens if I run it on here? Is that okay? What if I run it on there? So here's the method. So I'll spend the next 25 minutes telling you about the, the method. So we model the important entities that we have to worry about. So first of all, the platform. This is the underlying hardware and software on which the services might run. So it could be an Azure cloud. It could be your company's data center. It could be a mobile phone. It could be the, my, my laptop here. Then you also can model the networks through which the services can communicate. Then there's the services themselves components of the application which communicate with each other in a distributed system in order to meet the, the requirements. Then there's the data that is transferred between those 
services. So we model applications just as directed graphs. So the services are the nodes, the vertices, and the connections represent the data transmission between those, those services. Those are the edges of the graph. So that's a very simple one, a producer-consumer application, and you can see the two vertices, the two services, and the one edge with the data being transferred between them. You can do this for more complicated ones. Here's a one level up of complication. You've now got two edges because it's a client-server application. And the workflow examples of the type I talked about in the last talk that we use on eSign Central, again, you can see that you can model those as directed graphs. Okay, how do we model security? Well, we model it as a conjunction. So, uh, it, conjunction, you'll know about conjunctions and, logical and, of a set of mathematical inequalities. And in order to do this, there is a little bit of notation that you need to remember. So I'm going to use SI for a service with unique identifier I. I'm going to use PI for a platform with the unique identifier I. I'm going to use NIJ to represent a network between platform I and platform J. I'm going to use uh, D. Now, data, because you can have multiple ports between your applications, so each service can have multiple connections between them, then you need to specify not just the service, but the port. So I'm saying that it's i.x is service i port x. Uh, and then you specify the security location, the security level of one of these entities. So I'll use L for location, and I'll put the entity in brackets. Okay, so hopefully that's that, that's the only notation that you need to, to remember. And then what you do is you have your directed graph represent your application, and you create this conjunction of inequalities. And this is how you do it. So for every service, you, you create an inequality which says that the level of security of the platform on which that service runs must be greater than or equal to the level of security that you require for the service. So you wouldn't take a service that was really important to you and put it on a compromised laptop, would you? You wouldn't want to do that because you would worry that the laptop would grab the data from the service and send it to somebody you didn't want to send it to. So you need to know that the security level of the platform is greater than or equal to that of the service. Then for every data connection, so for every edge in this directed graph, there are three inequalities which you create. So firstly... The first two say that the, the security level of the data must be less than or equal to that of the platforms which the data is going to be stored on. So if you have data that goes from one platform to another, the security level of those two platforms must be greater than or equal to that of the data. Again, you wouldn't put sensitive data on a low security platform because something in the operating system of that platform or an illegal um, piece of software in that platform might copy all your data and send it over to some other organization or some enemy that you wouldn't want to see the data. So that's why you get those two inequalities. And then the third inequality is about the, the network. So this is the, the coffee shop problem. So you need to know that the security level of the network across which you're transmitting data must be greater than or equal to that of the data that's being transmitted. So any questions about, about that? Because everything follows from, from that. Yeah? Yeah, so, so that's a really good question. So the question is, how do you know what security level to, a, uh, to assign to a network? Well, like all of these things, sometimes people use certification levels, security certification levels, but security... Is, a, is about trust and it's a socio-technical issue. It's not purely a technical issue. There's no way you can, you can take some software and you can run a tool over it that tells you what security level it is, nor a network. So these levels are assigned by experts, by people who look at the applications and look at the networks and the platforms and they make a judgment. They say, in my, in my judgment, this network is at this, this particular level. So for example... Um, what a lot of people do is, so I'm going to use integers 
to represent these, these, these security levels. A lot of people will say that any network uh, that isn't in my organization, so for example the Starbucks network, I'm going to give a level zero, 0 to. But my own network's organization, I'm going to give a level of 1, say, to it. So it's, it's a, an expert judgment. Any other questions? Okay, so let's see how we, we use this. So here's, here's the first very simple example. So if you follow those rules for this producer-consumer with some data being transferred between these two services, you get these set of inequalities, which you combine together as conjunction. So what you get is that the level of platform 1 must be greater than or equal to service 1, the producer service. The level of platform 2 must be greater than or equal to that of the consumer service. Um, the level of platform 1 must be greater than or equal to the data which it's going to transmit to service 2. And so the level of platform 2 also has to be greater than the level of that data. And then finally, the security level of the networks, this is the question that you asked, has to be greater than or equal to that of the, the data that's transmitted over it. So that's just a mechanical creation of those inequalities from the previous rules. And another, if you read uh, papers on multi-level security, because this is a form of multi-level security, then people often illustrate these uh, security levels with lattices like this, where you use these arrows to represent greater than or equal to. So if you find that easier to understand, that's the security lattice which you get for that particular application. Okay, I'll do another one. So here's the, the client-server one. So you get basically, it's, it's exactly as it was before for the producer-consumer, except you've now got the data, the result coming back from the server to the client. So you get uh, some other inequalities for that. So for, let's have a look. So for uh, D21 to 11, that's, the, that's the, the data coming backwards then you get those inequalities which say that the level of platform 2 has to be greater than that of that data. The level of platform 1 has to be greater than that of that data because that data is, arrives at platform, platform 1. And the network uh, between 2 and 1 has to be greater than or equal to that of the data. Okay? Right. So this is what happens now. So once you've described, you've modeled your system like that, then what you have to do is you have to, in order to answer these questions, we have to bind those variables where we know the, the values. So where we have a value for the, the security level of a network or a service or the data, then we bind those variables to those values. And so you get a set of inequalities with some of the variables bound, and then we simplify it. And once we've simplified it, then we get some uh, results. And we get three results. So Sometimes you get, yes, the security, the security constraints, the security requirements have been met. Other times you get, no, they can't be met. Because of the bindings you've given to some of those variables, because, say, you've used the Starbucks coffee shop network as part of your application, then you cannot meet your security requirements. But then there's the third category, which we'll see, where you get a range of values. Because they're inequalities, sometimes you get inequalities left in the result. And that then tells you that you can use a range of networks as long as their level is at this level or below. Or you can use uh, a cloud as long as it's at this security level or above. So let's go through an example with this. So here's the client-server example. I've just copied that out again, exactly the same inequalities. And this is uh, one of the challenges that I was given in the, in the uh, bar in Newcastle by my, by my friend one Friday evening, which was, we've got a system like this, what do we know about the, see there's a mobile phone in the bottom right, so somebody wants, in their organization, wants to use a mobile phone to access the server for a particular application. And the question is, can they? Or will it compromise the security of the application? And so what we do is we go through and we give values to all of the variables that we know. So we know, for example, that platform one, which is the, that's a server 
within an organization, they consider that to be high security. I'm only going to use two values for security here, but the method works for any range of values. But I'll just use zero for low, one for high to keep things simple. So, uh, so the, the, the value assigned to that platform by the expert is one. And they also trust the service that was written by really good programmers within the organization. So they give that a value of one as well. The service that's going to run on the, um, uh, as a client, then they, that was an external service. They're not really sure of the security of that service, but they're happy to, to consider using it, but it's at level zero. Then for the, the data being transferred, the data in both directions is high security. Okay, so you need to worry about the, the, the security level of the, of the platforms which are sending and receive it because of that security level and you need to worry about the security level of the network but uh, that's, that's considered to be one in this case. So question is we'll leave the variable we're interested in which is the security level of that mobile phone we'll leave that unbound so we leave that as a question mark and we'll see what values it can take. So if we do that so all we do is we take the previous inequalities and we substitute in values and you end up with these values here. Um, so you get this set of inequalities. And once you've got that, of course, you can simplify it. And I've given some rules here. So you'll get the slides after the talk. But I've given some rules to do this. But you'll know all those rules anyway. So there's only three rules. So if you've got two integers, i and j, if i is greater than or equal to j, then you can say that's true. If it's not, it's false. Um, and then you've got two other rules, which are just to do where you've got a variable, which in this case we'll, say, we'll call v, and you've got two inequalities about variable v. So v's got to be greater than or equal to i, and it's got to be greater than or equal to j, and obviously you can simplify that because it's got to be greater than or equal to the maximum of those two values. So if v has to be greater than 2, and v has to be greater than 3, then you know that v has to be greater than 3 to satisfy both those inequalities. And finally, the opposite of that, which is where you've got i is greater than or equal to v and j is greater than or equal to v, then you can just take the minimum. And for people like yourselves who are, who are um, very proficient at maths, I, that's very straightforward. There's nothing, there's nothing new about that. But if you do that, then you can, you can take those, um, that set of inequalities with the variables bound, and you can... Simplify it. So this is my attempt to write with a pen on a, on a computer. And I, I struggled a bit, but uh, you can see that using rule 1, 1 is greater than or equal to 1, so that, that just reduces to true. Um, yeah, so it's only rule 1 in this. And then you end up with two, uh, two equations about um, P2. So in the top one, it's got to be greater than or equal to 0. The bottom one, it's got to be greater than or equal to 1. So using the second rule, you can simplify that. And you end up with this result, which is P2 is greater than or equal to, to 1. So that tells you. So what does, that, what does that tell you? Well, it tells you that you can't allow somebody to use a bring-your-own device with this application because the, uh, the security level of a platform that you know nothing about is at the lowest level of security, and therefore you cannot use it for this, for this particular application. Okay. I'll do two more examples. So this is the roaming example. So this is uh, my friend, again, saying he had a case where somebody was driving around a city in a car using an application, the similar, uh, another client-server application, and what they were interested in was whether or not so it wasn't, you didn't have a bring your own device, it was an, oh, the company's phone, so that was okay. But could, as he went from the Wi-Fi within the company out to a, a cell, cell phone network, and then he roamed around the cell phone network, sometimes went into coffee shops, sometimes went back into his car, was that a problem? So in this case, we do exactly the same thing, but we just leave the network unbound. So I've, I've bound the security level of P2, the phone, but I've left the, the value of the network unbound. And if you go through the same process, what you find is that um, the level that the network has to be must be greater than or equal to 1. So you can't use it 
on a, an untrusted network. You can't use it in Starbucks. Um, so what do you do in that case? Well, you could just um, stop the, the application working at that point. So you might think of changing the way in which we build applications so that every time the, the system can roam, every time a client can roam, instead of roaming, it then goes, if it knows the security level of the network, then it can call the system, can call, use this method embodied in a tool to work out whether or not roaming is allowed. And if it doesn't, uh, in some cases it could just freeze the application. Well, one case that my friend had was where the application had to brick itself. So the, the phone just had to uh, become a brick. Do you, is that a, you know when a phone becomes bricked? Do you have that phrase? Ah, that's it. So that's where you have a, your phone and it just won't work at all. You can't switch it on. So one client wanted to have the phone when it was roaming into a place it shouldn't to just go into that state where it stopped working. So there was no way the application or anything could use. But you could also think about changing the configuration of the application. So this, this is an obvious thing to do. So on your left hand side, this is what you do. Let's say your application is actually collecting data, perhaps GPS location. Normally it can send it to the server as long as it's using a, a network of the high security level, but if not, then it can uh, move to the configuration on the right hand side where it just stores the data locally on the phone and then only when the, it moves back to a trusted network does it send that data back to the organization server. Okay, so you can start to think about having exception handling on roaming which then, depending on the value that you get from these, in, these inequalities, determines the configuration of the application that you use. Okay, finally, the healthcare data analysis. So I will, I, I will use the running example because this is what motivated it. And you get a larger set of inequalities. I won't go through, through all of them, but they're just created by the usual process. And then what I do is I bind some of those inequalities. So I bind the values of the services so, and the data. So the key thing to notice is that the data that's going between service 0 and 1, that's the sensitive data. That's the data that identifies a patient. So let me show you that. So if you go back to that, so it's the, the data going between service 0 and service 1. And you can see it's about a Mrs. A. Smith so Smith's a very common surname in, in England, and this is her data. So we aren't allowed to send that over anything which is not at the high security level. So that's why the data for uh, Mrs. Smith's data is at level one, but the data for the other connections are, is, at a lower, is at a lower level. Because after service one, if we look back again, the data is anonymized. You can't tell who the patient is. Okay, so we, we do that. And we run it through the, the system. So this is, I, have, I, I program in Haskell. So I've written, a, I've written a Haskell tool to do this. So running through it, then you get this set of inequalities, which give you information about the platforms and also the networks connecting those platforms. So there we are. So what do you do now? So we've got this information. And remember, what we were wondering was, how do we run this on a mixture of a public and a private cloud? So... Here's a public and a private cloud, and let's say these are the security locations we assign to those clouds. So the person, the security expert, believes that the private cloud is at the top level and a public cloud is at a lower level. So one and zero we give, we give to them. So what we then do is we can assign a security level to each network as well. So I'm going to say that the security level between these two clouds, I'm going to have that as zero because I, it's the internet and I, and I don't know whether anybody's uh, listening in. But we'll assume that within any cloud, the network is at a high security level. Okay, you can change that if you want. The, the method works, but that's what I'm going to assume here. And so if you do that, then first thing that you can do is what we're going to do now is to try to work out all the possible valid deployments of these services onto the clouds. So what you can do is you can say that platform zero, because it has to be level greater than or equal to one, you can only have that on the private cloud. 
Same with platform 1, because that also has to be at level 0 or 1. But platform 2, which is running service 2, which isn't sensitive, it's not accessing any sensitive data, so that can be on either cloud, the public or the private cloud. So you do that. And this then gives you a set of options. So we get four options as it happens. So option 1 um, is where platform 0, so that's running service 0, is on cloud 1. Platform 2 is on cloud 1, and then the other two services are on the cloud 0, the, the public cloud, and so on. So you get all those different, uh, those different options, and it's perhaps easier to look at them like this. So this is the set of four valid options which you get for that health healthcare example. So it's sometimes quite interesting to do it by this method because you get options which you didn't consider before. So here's... For example, I think that clever people would, like yourselves, would guess it, would come up with level one, yeah? And you would also work out about uh, level, level four, yeah? Where you keep everything on a private cloud. But level two and level three, very few people would come up with those as viable options. They're rather odd. And often if you've got complex workflows and lots of clouds or lots of devices, you can get tens of these different options that you consider, most of which a human would not uh, have ever come up with. And some of them are actually better than the options that humans do come up with. So the question is, once you've got, in this case, these four options, or in other cases you might have tens of options, how do we decide which option is the best one? All of them meet the security requirements, so there's no issue there, but they may have different performances, they might have different levels of reliability, or they might have different costs. So you might have to pay more for some options rather than others. And how do we decide which one to choose? Okay, so this worried us as well, because we didn't want to just arbitrarily pick one which might not be the best. And so again, having found a method which gives us these options, we then wanted to have a method which worked out which was the cheapest one. And so for that, what we need are cost models, and I'll tell you about those in the next lecture. Okay, so any questions? Yes, so one of the things that, um, to take one example that we had with one um, uh, with one um, type of application, then let me, let me slightly... The method works for as many clouds as you want, and we, we, I've got somebody who's trying to uh, write an efficient algorithm where if you had um, tens of clouds and, and hundreds of services, it could, work, it could work it out. In fact, one of the projects, those three ladies uh, there, are, are trying to do this using the cloud to scale up that, that sort of analysis. But uh, let me... Let me give you another version of what you've just said. So if you look at that set of options and you're worried about reliability, so it's really important that you're able to run this workflow, what do you think is the, is the weak link at the moment for this, for this uh, particular workflow? So let me ask a question. If the green cloud, which is the public cloud, went down, would we be in trouble? Would we be able to execute this, this workflow? Yes? Yeah, so, I'll, so if the green cloud is down, you can use option four, which doesn't use it. Yeah, option four is just doing everything on the private cloud. So your, this system can be made reliable to failures, in this case, in the public cloud. But, what's the problem? You always use a private cloud. So an organization we work with realized that they had one data center, and it had to run a particular application. They would lose a lot of money if it stopped, if it stopped working. But, if their data center, their one data center, went down because of a power cut or some other problem, then they couldn't do it. So what they did was then to get another data center, and that, meant, that gave them then 
three clouds effectively, two internal and one external. And so they knew then that they could always run this type of application. So you can, and we have done, use this to analyze um, reliability options, dependability options for, for clouds as well, because it shows you all the possible um, uh, ways in which you can map your workflows, your, your distributed applications onto clouds. Any other questions? Yes? Yep. Yes. 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 Yeah. So, so I know your question. So, um, so the question is, um, there's no rules which are about. Let me go back to the rules. About the relationship between data and services. Yeah. Where is it? Is it this one? Yeah. So, so uh, you might get a problem. Oh, that's uh, that's my cricket pitch, not uh, not my slides. Hold on. Um, control P. Uh, duplicate. That's my Haskell program. Is it up? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so there's no rules about the relationship between services and the data that they read and write. And in multi-level security, a lot of work in multi-level security was done um, in the, the military. And the idea was that you had uh, somebody in the military, let's say a general, and you wanted to know were they allowed to read documents at particular levels of classification and whether you're allowed to write documents at particular levels of classification. And the, uh, the example that you were, were, you were giving was like uh, Bell Padula, which is a very commonly used system, which says that you can't, uh, read data which is higher than your level of security. So you can read it at your level or below, and you can't write data which is a, a lower level of security than yourself. So that's Bell Lepadula, which has been used for military applications for about 30 years. And if you read the paper that I, um, that I, I referenced, the one that's in the project description, then that also adds the Bell Lepadula rules. And for this presentation, I didn't add them because it takes time and it's more complicated, but you can add whatever rules you want about services and data to the inequalities, and then you can process them through the tool. And I, and I do that quite often. Yeah. And you, because it's, it's, it's general in that it's just, it just deals with inequalities, you could also take some other system that you wanted as well and, and use that. For example, just a system that uh, the security level of a service, um, sorry, security level of a platform had to be greater than or equal to that of the data that was on that platform. 